All right, let's get started. First off, you might be wondering, like, why is there a dog on the announcement slide? I figure y'all get a kick out of it. We just got a dog. <laughs> yeah, her, her name's Ripley, so. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah, she is. Um, uh, she She's an adult, but a very young adult. But man, it, it took me about probably 10 minutes to get her to sit still just for, just for that. She was She's a ball of energy, so. Um, I figured you all would get a kick out of that. My uh, my, my cat wasn't really the, the biggest fan in the world, so. <laughs> Ruga took one look and went, who is that? <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so let's get started. A couple things. So first off, um, if you look at the slide, I have here some calculations related to example 5B. Um, if you recall, at the end of lecture last time, I said, you know, one of the things we didn't have a chance to do was ACI minimum reinforcement. But, I mean, it's really, really simple. Um, I also posted a video on the playlist. It's like five minutes long on going through this, but I can probably do it in like 20 seconds right now. So here's the beam that we analyzed in example five. B is 10, D is 23 inches, and the uh, beam had three number eight, so the area of steel was like 2.36 uh, square inches. So you need to check ACI minimum reinforcement uh, requirements just to ensure that you've met uh, the minimum uh, amount uh, of re the requirement for the minimum amount of rebar. So the equation that you use to uh, perform that calculation uh, is this right here. This, this is the equation that you're using. So what I did over here uh, above that is you've got this fraction times the maximum of either 3 square root of FC prime or 200. Well, if you do 3 square root of FC prime, it comes out to about 189.7. So the maximum of this and 200 is 200. So it's just B times D times 200 over Fy. The, the main thing to keep in mind is that since this is in PSI, this has got to be in PSI. So you don't put 60 KSI, you put 60,000 PSI. So when you do the math, it comes out to about 0.77 square inches. And we've more than met that because this is the minimum amount of steel we need and uh, we provided 2.36. So, you know, we're, we're perfectly uh, good to go there. Um, any questions on that? Okay, there's a video, uh, it's like five minutes that, that goes into it in a little more detail, but uh, again, not really much more because that, that's basically it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, let's remember that you all have a homework due Wednesday. It's kind of a beefier assignment. Um, before we get into stuff today, does anybody have any questions about that assignment? Have you all started the assignment? Okay. All right. Okay. That's due Wednesday. And your homework three has already been posted. It's due Monday. But, but be, let me be clear. Homework three is really short. Homework three is really just two problems. And all it is is ACI requirements. That's it. And the reason why I do that uh, is this. I used to not give an assignment specifically on ACI requirements, and I would just jump right into design. And everybody seemed to get the design, but having a little, I've, I've learned that having just a little bit of practice on, on the ACI requirements makes the design aspect so much easier. So this is a really short assignment. It's just two problems. It's basically just, here's two beams. Evaluate ACI requirements. What's the strain? Uh, uh, have you met the strain limits? Have you met minimum steel? Uh, so on and so forth. I don't think this assignment will be a particularly long one, but the practice, I think, is, uh, is incredibly necessary. So sound good? All right. So let's remember, you all got a homework assignment due Wednesday. All right. Um, today, um, seeing how this is reinforced concrete design, I figure it would be a good idea to actually start talking about design. Okay. So what I'm going to do today, this is going to seem a little bit like movie time, but um, I'm going to lay out how we can actually design a beam. So let me explain, let me make sure everybody's clear on what I mean by that. So up until now, I, I, um, I, the way I term it, what we've been doing so far is analysis. Like here's a beam, what's the cracking moment? Here's a beam, what's the maximum flexural capacity? So we've basically been given the, the, the fundamental information associated with the beam, and then taking that information, our next step is to then uh, 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 do the analysis, assess it, assess its capacity. But now what I want to do is I'll say, okay, now this is design. What if you don't have any information? What if your goal is to design the beam, to determine how much reinforcement goes there, uh, to determine the width, the, the depth, the so on and so forth? 
Okay, so we need we need to approach that. We need a way of going about that. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to engage into a little bit of a discussion about the economy of, of concrete beams because obviously that's one of our main goals. We want to design structures that are economical. I mean, I promise you, if you have a beam scenario and you uh, decide to size a beam that's 200 inches deep and 40 inches wide and has 18 number 14 rebar in it, it'll probably work. I promise you. That's a really big beam, though. That's not very economical. So we need a design process that, that not only will achieve a design that's safe, but one that's economical as well. So I, I want to get into the economy. And in order to discuss economy, I'm going to start talking about two terms. Um, I'm going to mention our resistance factor, our fee value, later. But what I really want to uh, begin is I want to introduce a new concept to you. I want to introduce to you the concept of what's called a reinforcement ratio. Now, in, in simple terms, a reinforcement ratio is nothing more than the area of steel divided by the area of concrete, or in this case, B times D, the effective area of concrete. And, and all it really is is saying, you know, if I got a beam and my reinforcement ratio, let's say, is 0.02, then 2% of that beam is steel. Okay, that's, all, that's all a reinforcement ratio is. It's just a ratio of how much steel you got versus how much concrete you've got. And, and analytically and from a design perspective, it affords us a lot of opportunities because if we've got the dimensions of a beam and we know our reinforcement ratio, it can then tell us how much, um, uh, how much reinforcement we need. So it kind of reduces uh, the number of variables we have uh, uh, a little bit. So I want to take this reinforcement ratio and I'm going to do a little bit of algebra with it. Um, so you can follow along with the algebra if you'd like. I mean, all the slides are online, so there's no real need to, to like jot everything down in, this, in these derivations. I just want you to sort of follow along with my logic here. So uh, let's start off with everything up here, okay? Now, you all have seen these calculations before, right? Like the first equation, 0.85 FC prime AB equals ASFY. Therefore, we can solve for A, right? This is what we did for a reinforced concrete beam, uh, determining its maximum flexural capacity. The first step was to determine the depth of the stress block A. And we determined that depth because it's, that depth is the magical number that maintains equilibrium, C equals T. So that's what that is. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this reinforcement ratio. So I'm defining this reinforcement ratio as the area of steel divided by BD. So essentially, you can kind of think of it as the area of steel divided by the area of the concrete. So if I, re I rearrange that, the area of steel is just rho BD. Sound good? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression for the stress block and I'm going to sub in this area of steel. So everywhere that it says area of steel, I'm going to sub in rho BD. Now, so that's how I went from here to here. The way I go from here to this expression on the right is if you notice I got a B on the top and a B on the bottom, so the B is canceled. Everybody okay with that? Not too complicated. Okay. I'm going to keep going with this a little bit. I'm going to say, all right, now let's look at this from a moment capacity standpoint. Everybody up here should recognize this equation. This is the nominal moment capacity of a reinforced concrete beam, ASFY times D minus A over 2. Well, let's do the same substitutions, okay? All right, I've got the area of steel, rho BD, and now I've got this new definition for A that I just came up with right here. So A equals rho DFY over 0.85 FC prime. Okay, so if I plug and chug and I do a little bit of grunt work, okay, I achieve this expression that you see here uh, in the box. Okay, everybody okay with that? Now, so what we've done, so what's in this box and what's here, there's nothing different. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. But um, I've sort of reformatted it in a way that, that really helps us out by a couple things. Number one, if you notice... If I look at this term, see, see right here, see how BD squared is by itself? Like, like it's, there's BD squared times a quantity, but it's sort of by itself. See, one of the advantages of this is this is an expression for moment capacity, but everything associated with the dimensions of the beam are, are something I can isolate. So, for instance, if I took this equation and I divided by all of, say, this, if I divided by all of that, then I would have BD squared equals a pile of junk, okay? And that's kind of beneficial because if in design mode, that can, tell, that can give us a tool for, well, how exactly do we design a beam? How do we design a beam? I, I have the, the dimensions of that beam equal something. So that, that, that gives us a, a, a tool for design purposes. 
It also helps us from an economy standpoint because if you look at this, this equation, really once you've got the dimensions of the beam, you're looking at moment capacity as a function of material properties, which can easily be assumed at the beginning of design, and your reinforcement ratio. So you can really make some very clear decisions about the economy of a beam. So what I've got here uh, is a plot. So I've taken this equation here, and, and I basically just plotted it in Excel. And what I'm varying is the reinforcement ratio, and I'm plotting that against what I get over here. And what I'm getting over here is sort of like a, a normalized expression of how strong a beam is. Now, now, what this curve is showing shouldn't really be that surprising, because look what's happening. As the reinforcement ratio increases, as we go right on the curve, this expression increases, which is sort of like a, you know, what does that mean? As I throw more rebar into the beam, the beam gets stronger. Of course, right? I mean, I throw more reinforcement into the beam, it's going to get stronger. I mean, the, 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 the term does sort of pops in, into my head. But, but let's take this and go one step further, okay? I don't really care about nominal moment capacity. When, I, when I'm looking at design. MN doesn't, I don't care. I care about phi MN. I care about MN that's been adjusted by that strength reduction factor phi. Remember that? That's what's usable. Now, we did that example in class last time and phi came out to be like what, 0.9? Something like that? Phi usually comes out to be uh, uh, 0.9 or something like that. This is sort of an interesting curve. All right, I want to take a look at what you've got over here on the left. Remember, phi is not always 0.9. Phi is actually dependent upon what the strain in the steel is, right? What's interesting is that if you keep throwing reinforcement into a beam, like this is an easy way of thinking about it. The more rebar that you throw into a beam, the more that you're demanding out of the concrete. Because remember, compression equals tension. So if you throw a whole lot of rebar, a whole lot of tension into the beam, the concrete has to respond with an equal amount of compression. And you start carrying that math down the line, what, what you find is that the more reinforcement you throw into the, into the beam, the less strain you get in the steel. The less strain you get in the steel, what happens is your fee value starts to drop. So it's kind of interesting, like a lot of, like, you know, if you're in a design scenario, you think, oh, well, I'll just throw more reinforcement into it. That might not actually help you, okay? Because you might get a whole lot more nominal moment capacity, but you won't get as much effective capacity for design. Because the more steel you throw in, the strain, the resulting strain in that steel drops, your fee value drops, and you might literally just be wasting rebar. I mean, think about from a reinforcement ratio of about 0 0.018 to about 0 0.028. You're just sitting there throwing steel into the beam, and you're not really getting an increase in capacity. Because the more steel you throw in, you're not getting as much strain out of that steel. So it's something I want you to think about. I want you to sort of be engineers about it. Yeah, it, 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 the, your, your gut feeling, you know, the, 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 the R complex center in your brain says, throw more steel in there because it'll be safer. Not really useful, though. Okay? Make sense? That's just something I, I wanted you to, uh, to, to think about. Now. Like I said, what we can do is we can take this expression and we can solve for, for BD squared. So this is actually a really useful expression because what we've done is we basically said that the dimensions of the beam equal something. Okay? Now what's that something? Well, I propose it's a function of three things. Number one, it's a function of material parameters like FC prime and FY which are really easy to, to assume at the very beginning of a problem. You know, if you're using 4 KSI concrete, 60 uh, KSI steel, pretty straightforward. You know, that's gonna, in the real world, that might be a function of material availability or the uh, constraints of your design. So that's pretty easy to assume right at the beginning. It's also a function of MN, which in design world, what, what that MN really reflects is your required strength. In other words, you've done a structural analysis, you've determined your factored moment, so basically you've determined how much load that beam needs to resist. That comes from your, uh, uh, from your analysis setting. So really the only value that you need for design is a value for rho, this reinforcement ratio, which rho, again, is, is really useful because it can highlight the economy of a section and it's a really useful tool uh, for design. Now, um, I'm going to show you a couple different ways that we can use uh, rho to perform a design. 
Um, first thing that we can do uh, is we can uh, choose a row in order to achieve a certain strain in the steel. I'm, I'm going to talk about that later. But one of the other things we can do right off the bat is we can just literally guess or assume a, a row value for design purposes. Um, this, is, uh, this came out of a previous edition of the ACI specs, and it was, uh, uh, it was meant to be a, a, a reinforcement ratio limit on deflection. But honestly, um, it's, not, it, it's not in place anymore in the spec. There's nothing in the spec that says we have to use uh, rho as 0.18 uh, FC prime over FY for anything. But it actually is pretty useful from a design standpoint. And when we go through our step-by-step -step design procedure here in a second, you're going to see um, that 0.18 FC prime over FY tends to get used quite a bit. If you go to your textbook and you look at some of the problems in Chapter 4, you'll see how some of the problems in Chapter 4 say, design a beam for such and such and such and such, use rho equals 0.18 FC prime over FY for your design. That's where this, is, this, uh, this comes from, is that it's a... Uh, it's, it, it, it's sort of like a rule of thumb. It's something that, you know, if you design, you know, a thousand, you know, reinforced concrete beams throughout your career, you sort of learn little shortcuts and learn little tricks to make your life a little easier. This is one of those little tricks that'll, that'll make your life a little easier in design, in the design world. So this is going to be a row value that we use for design. So I, I would argue that unless you have any, any other requirements on, on your design uh, 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 situation, and you have no idea where to start, this is a good reinforcement ratio uh, that you can choose uh, at the beginning. Uh, another very common um, uh, uh, method for, for selecting a reinforcement ratio is, is to look at it a little more scientifically and to say, all right, let's figure out how much reinforcement we need in order to get a certain strain in the steel. So like a, a, a common one might be, remember how we get a fee value of 0.9 right around a strain of 0.005. Y'all remember that? So what we might do is we might say, all right, well, how about we do this? How about we look at our, our similar triangles, our strain profile. We might say, all right, let's try and back calculate and figure out what would our reinforcement be if we wanted to achieve a, a certain strain. Like let's say we plugged in 0.005 here. Well, we can do a little bit of rearranging and we can say, well, we can solve for the C over D ratio. That's pretty easy. It's just algebra and plug and chug. We can go back to our stress block and we can say, all right, well, if I've got an equation or a representation for stress block in terms of rho, well, A equals beta 1 C, I can solve for C. So if I got that, I can solve for C over D. Rearrange, plug and chug, solve for rho. Here you go. So this is a little bit more of a little more scientific, a little more fancier way of coming up with a row value for design. You don't have to do this. Um, there, are, there might be some design challenges where you say, okay, design this beam and design it so that you get a strain of 0.01. Well, this would be how you do that. Here's your target strain value, plug and chug, and you'll get your, uh, your reinforcement ratio. If you felt that, just now, if you felt that like I've been sitting here and um, uh, uh, been throwing, you know, terms and terms and terms at you, you're like, where, hold, whoa, hold on. Like I'm having a hard time following exactly like what I need to do to design a beam. Give me a step-by-step -step process, Dr. Mike, so I can do a beam design. Procedures for design. Step by step. You like that? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some procedures for design. Okay. And and I think you're going to see as we go through this because I'm not going to just read them out to you. We're going to take a little bit of time and explain them so that you understand what's going on because I don't want to just throw a bunch of stuff at you. I want you to sort of get what's going on. So I I'm going to harken back a little bit to homework number one. Remember homework number one, I gave y'all a, a floor plan, y'all had some beams spaced at, you know, 10 feet or 12 feet or what have you, and you had a beam of a certain span length, and you could take those loads and those elements and determine, you know, the maximum bending moment, the maximum shear, et cetera, et cetera, right? Everybody in this room understands structural analysis. So I'm going to sort of start there and go from there to design. So step one, is basically to do your structural analysis, to compute the factored moments on the beam. Now, 
That's a problem in design mode, and it's especially a problem when you have absolutely no idea what the beam looks like. Because what load must all beams be able to withstand? Their own self-weight. Well, what's the self-weight of the beam in design mode? You don't know. You have no clue because you, don't, you, you haven't designed the beam. So one of the things that you're going to have to do, and you're going to see a, sort of a trend here in these procedures, you have to assume a beam self-weight. You have to make a guess, okay? And, and I think this is where a, a lot of times a lot of the, you know, your scientific engineering students, they're, they're sort of like, what? I have to just get, like, what do you mean guess? Like, what are you talking about? How, how, how do you make a guess? Okay, well, a couple things. Number one, um, ACI does give you some, some guidance on how to make a guess. Um, this is one of those things where after you design two, three hundred beams, you just get better at making these guesses. You get a better feel for it. But for now, um, if you don't have any idea on how to make a guess, you know, there's, there's some guidance to, to, to go off of. Another thing is, well, wait a minute. You're just making a guess? Is that fine? No, I'm, I'm not just making a guess because any assumption that you make, you must then go back and verify that assumption. So I'm actually, one of the things that I actually want to get across to you is that throughout these design procedures, we are going to make assumptions, but we are going to go back and verify those assumptions. Okay? Sound good? Okay. So first step is compute our factored moments. Dead loads, live loads, 1.2 dead, 1.6 live, uh, et cetera. Okay. Next. Okay. So what's going on here if phi mn has to be greater than or equal to mu, our resistances have to be greater than or equal to our loads, then mn has to be greater than or equal to mu over phi. So our step two is we can determine what our required mn is by taking mu and dividing it by phi. The problem is technically we don't know what phi is because that would be a guess. Remember phi depends on the strain in the steel. We don't know what that is right now. But we do know that what we would like it to be is 0.9. That's our desire. That's our, 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 our target. So we're going to make an assumption. There's another assumption. We're going to assume that phi equals 0.9. Okay? Sound good? Okay. Step three. We need to calculate a row for design purposes. What I mean by that is this is another guess. I, I, I'm not really saying it's an assumption because ultimately we're going to use this assumption to arrive at some real dimensions for the beam. Then we'll validate the dimensions, of, uh, you know, validate that by analyzing it. So this isn't really an assumption we need to go back and verify. This is just something to get some dimensions for the beam and then we'll analyze that beam. So it's not that big of a deal. Now, we need to calculate a row for design purposes. When in doubt, use that. Just 0.18 FC prime over FY. If you don't want to use that, you can use this. If you know you, uh, a target strain in the steel, just plug and chug. That's very easy. So either one uh, works. So, but you need a, a row value for design purposes. Once you've got your row value and you've got your required MN, plug and chug to get BD squared. BD squared is essentially a um, a measure of how big your beam needs to be. Okay. Once you've got BD squared, you can figure out essentially through steps five and step six how big your beam needs to be. What's your required beam width? What's your required beam depth? Okay. Now, one of the things I have here is select dimensions to the nearest one inch increment. Do not give me a beam design that has a beam width of 10.62 inches. Don't do that. For our purposes, just go to the nearest uh, inch, okay? Um, nearest inch, uh, sometimes nearest two inches makes uh, a lot of sense if you're using like ready-made forms uh, and what have you. But uh, for our purposes, let's just go to the nearest inch. So we've got B values, we've got D values, and the height of the beam, based on cover requirements, we're just conservatively going to take that to be uh, D plus three, or plus three inches, because that's, that's a pretty common value to go off of. Sound good? Yes, sir. That, that's what I'm saying. That's, I'm saying, like, if it's 10.62, round up to 11. I'd round up. Yeah, round up. So that, that's a fair point, round up. Let me also say this. Um, it actually, it matters a little bit, but not too much. Um, two points to make. One, once you get your beam dimensions, there's still steel to pick. 
and we're typically going to be conservative there as well because we're always going to end up rounding up a little bit. And two, <coughs> even if we follow the procedures directly and, and you know follow them to a T, there's still the chance of some iteration. So it's just that's just some of the nature of of, of design. It can be your self weight not coming out right. Remember, you're guessing your self weight. Like th think about it like this: if you make a guess and the the beam is 200, like your guess is 200 pounds per foot, and the beam comes out and it's actually 350 pounds per foot, you may have to tweak your design again because it's a lot heavier than you assumed it was. And that's just the nature of design. There's really no other way around that. Now, let me also uh, 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 qualify that by saying, if you assume like 300 pounds per foot and it comes out like 250, hey, you're good because you've, you've already accounted for that. And that's just part of the open-ended nature of design. Does that, that make sense? Well, let, let, let me do this. Let me say this. We're going to we're going to do an example, okay? And when we get into that example, there's a number of things we can tweak, and it's 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 more about trying to figure out what you tweak, what will affect the design capacity the most. And we kind of need to go through an example to kind of see that. So that'll make sense here in a little. Like to give you a a, a a taste, one of the things that actually really doesn't affect the the flexural capacity of a reinforced concrete beam that much is FC prime. It affects it a lot less than you think it would. Like if you double your FC prime versus, say, doubling your area of your steel, phenomenally different results. But we kind of need to go through the math first to kind of see it. So these are good questions, though. Sound good? All right. Now, once you've got your beam dimensions and your row value, take row BD. Um, to uh, uh, take your row BD in order to determine an area of steel. Now you can actually, now that you have beam dimensions, be a little more scientific on step seven, but honestly the math gets a little funkier and I, I sort of just say, uh, let's just keep it simple right now. And again, you just need to get something to, uh, uh, you just need to get something to work with. Um, next thing, once you've got your required area of steel, you need to choose a reinforcement pattern that meets uh, beam width requirements. We'll talk about that here in a second. Then you've got a design. Your last and final step, check your assumptions. So go back and validate those assumptions that you made. And don't worry, if it seems like I've thrown a lot at you, we're going to do a, a very comprehensive example. We'll go step by step, and I think you're going to see this really ain't so bad. All right. Sound good so far? Now, how many of you have your beam design aid that has those areas of rebar with you? Break that out. Let me pull this up. I'll pull it up here on the screen. Yes. Beam design aid. Oh. It should look like this. You're going to need that. In fact, you probably want it out today. Now, let me show you what's going on here. So the first thing that's going on here is there's two tables. The table on the top is, is pretty simple to understand. Like, for instance, I have a bar size de designation. So let's take a look at a number three. The area of a single number three bar is 0 0.011 square inches. So how much is two number threes? Three number threes, four number threes, pretty simple, right? Okay, so, so that's basically what this chart is. Now, on some of the rounding, like for instance, if you look at number sixes, you got 0 0.44, 0 0.88, like you'd expect like 1.32, so why are you getting 1.33? It's because there's pi in there. It's an irrational number. There's some rounding. This is taking care of the rounding. If you just take this value and multiply it by three versus actually accounting for the decimals, you get different values. And, and that, that's actually caused some consternation among some homework assignments in the past is that, you know, depending upon how you round your rebar, you can actually get different answers. So what I decided to do is I just decided to create this. So if everybody uses this, everybody would get the same answer. So that, that's kind of the reason why, uh, why I created this. You'll also, if needed, have this on an exam. But that's, that's not a big deal. Um, the one that's super easy to follow are the number nines, because the, the area of a single number nine is one square inch. So just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 so on and so forth. All right, sound good? 
Okay, the next thing that you need to assess is this table here at the bottom. Okay, now it says minimum web width for multiple bars. So let me kind of explain uh, what's going on uh, in this table so that you understand. Okay, let's say that you have a beam that is 10 inches wide. Okay, and you decide that based on the economics, the most economical solution is 20 number three bars. My question is, do you think you can feasibly space 20 bars in a beam that's only 10 inches wide? N no, right? In other words, um, if you have a beam and you've decided to pick four number sevens or three number eights or, or what have you, um, you have requirements on A, not only how to space those beams uh, uh, or space those bars between one another, but you also have requirements on something, bless you, you also have requirements on something called cover, okay? How many, uh, how many of y'all remember talking about cover in 321? Okay. If you don't remember uh, uh, cover, here's what cover is. Cover is defined as the, the space between the edge of a piece of rebar, between the edge of the bar and the edge of the concrete. In other words, if, if, I, if I'm looking at, let's say, let's say this is a beam, okay, and I have a piece of rebar going through that beam, cover would be that distance right here, okay? And cover requirements are going to be different dependent upon your application. Like, for instance, um, uh, if, uh, if you're designing a bridge, I'm, I'm, let, let, let's, let's pop quiz everybody. If you're designing a bridge, okay, in, let's say, West Virginia versus, let's say, I don't know, uh, um, southern, like, uh, uh, Louisiana or Alabama or Mississippi, somewhere like that, okay, if you're looking at the bridge deck, why do you think cover requirements in West Virginia would be more stringent than cover requirements in a place like Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana or somewhere like that? The bridge deck, the driving surface. The salts, exactly. We, we, you're exactly right. We have salt that we have to put on, on the road in, uh, in West Virginia because of the winter. You don't have to deal with that uh, in a place like Alabama or, or, or so on and so forth. So their cover requirements might be only something like an inch and a half and two inches, where for us, uh, it's like two and a half inches. So it's really meant to try and prevent uh, corrosion, uh, effects of the weather, and things like that. For instance, if you're looking at a, um, uh, a reinforced concrete beam uh, that's in a bridge over like a bay in uh, like Florida or Seattle where you've got like really brackish water, the, 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 the cover requirements get really strict. You're talking like four inches, six inches, something like that. So um, in, in order to protect reinforcement, we have certain cover requirements based on certain conditions. Now, for in, for in this class, we're mostly, uh, our, our, most of our applications are dealing with interior beams and columns in buildings. So a lot of the environmental impacts are taken out of, uh, taken out of the, uh, the wayside, and we're really dealing with just basic uh, reinforced concrete design. So a very common uh, cover requirement for, or a very common cover for what we're doing is an inch and a half, because it's inside, it's not exposed to the elements, so on and so forth. So, so for instance, if I have a beam, let's say I have a beam that has, in this image, I have three number 10 bars. Well, in order to place three number 10 bars, inside a, a reinforced concrete beam, you know, think about what I've got going on. I got an inch and a half of cover on each side. I got to get past the stirrup, which is a, this is, that's what you're seeing here, this sort of U-shaped stirrup, stirrup. It ties all the rebar together, and it's the primary element that we use in resisting shear. We'll talk about stirrups later. But, um, so we got the inch and a half of cover, we've got the stirrups, we've got the bends on the stirrups. We've got the bars themselves, and then we have the space in between the bars. They can't be right next to each other. You have to have some concrete in between. So, for instance, if I have three number 10 bars, what this is saying is that for three number 10 bars right here, the beam has to be at least 10.34 inches wide in order to safely uh, accommodate those bars. So what we'll do is we'll use the upper table to pick some some, some patterns of reinforcement, then we'll look at the bottom table and see if those patterns make sense. You see what I mean? Everybody okay with that? Well, if you're okay with that, then we have, 
Example six. This is a start to finish comprehensive design example. We are going to take that. We are going to take those system parameters. I, what? Um, I'm just making sure you all paid attention. It's Monday. I mean, come on. Um, we're going to take these parameters. We are going to design a reinforced concrete beam. Okay. So I've got a 22 foot long beam. It's simply supported. And I need to design that beam to withstand one kip per foot of dead load and two kips per foot of live load. Now, let, let's, let's pay attention to a couple things. So this dead load, uh, uh, another term for that is superimposed dead load. And what I mean by that is there's the self-weight of the beam, and then I've got one kip per foot on top of that. So that's what I mean by superimposed. So I have in addition to beam self-weight, but if you ever hear me use the term superimposed dead load, that's what that means. Okay? So I've got one kip per foot dead load, two kips per foot live load. Uh, I'm going to employ 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel, normal weight concrete. And then this is an approximate D over B ratio. It doesn't really matter. It would, our design would change very slightly uh, at the end if we didn't set that right uh, at the beginning. But just need to have something so that uh, we're all sort of going uh, about this uh, in the same fashion. Sound good? Any questions? Let's get to it. Okay. Okay. So, example six. Okay. So I am going to throw some parameters out here at the beginning. So we have a beam of 22 feet long. It has a superimposed dead load of one kip per foot and a live load of two kips per foot. Now, one thing about that live load, it's already been reduced. So you don't have to worry about live load reduction. We already took care of that. Okay. Now, we have an FC prime of four KSI. Pop quiz. Um, if I have an FC prime of 4 KSI, what other concrete material parameter do I know right now? How about this? What's beta 1? 0.85. Remember, it's 0.85 any time that FC prime is 4 KSI or lower. Anything higher than that, it's that straight line fit going down. So. So make sure everybody's on top of that. We have our FY of 60 KSI, and we have a unit weight of our concrete of 150 pounds per cubic foot, or 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot. Just so everybody's on page with the units uh, and whatnot. So far, so good? OK. So step one, OK, so we'll, we'll take our time with this. So step one. Step one is to compute factored moments. OK. Now, in order to do that, we've got to make an assumption. We have to assume. Self, beam self weight. Now, how heavy do y'all think this beam's going to be? That, that, um, <laughs> hence, let's, let's go to the table. <laughs> now, that's fine. That's totally fine. That's why this stuff is here. Okay? So, let's go to this slide. Okay, so let me explain what this, this table is. This table is actually a minimum thickness or a minimum height requirement, honestly, for deflection purposes. Um, we will probably be underestimating beam self-weight when we use this table, but we won't be way out there. We'll be sort of close. So this is a really good 
um, good place to uh, to make an assumption. So let's let's take a look at this. First off, let's look at the columns. Is this a cantilever beam? Is it a one end continuous? What is this? Simply supported. Is it a slab or a beam? Beam. So the minimum thickness or minimum height is L over 16. Okay. What's that? Well, hold on. You're right, but but we got we got to be careful on something. Okay. So we're going to use H min is L over 16, which you are right. It's 22 over 16, but it's 22 what over 16? Say it again. 22 feet over 16. So the number is going to be in feet, but beam dimensions, we typically refer to those uh, in inches. So I'm going to multiply that by 12 inches per foot. So what does that come out to be? There, yeah, so this right here, okay, this, I'm making a point right here. Write out the units. Literally put the word I and the letter N, you know, or, or letter I, letter N, you know, so 16.5 inches. Now I'm lazy, I'm gonna put the inch sign. But make sure that you're writing out your units. This is, I'm telling you, this right here, this is where mistakes are made, okay? Now that is a height um, for a width. I, I'm just gonna make a guess and say H over two. So that comes out to be like 8.25 inches. Um, that's probably also a little low, but again, we just need something to go with right here. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you all remember how to compute the weight of a beam? Remember pounds per foot? How do you do that? Well, unit weight times the volume will give you the total weight of the beam. Divide, well, so you're dividing by the length. So let, let's, let's carry that out. How, how would I do this? The unit weight times the... No, no. Hold, hold on. Times the area. Okay. Hold on. I'm gonna bring back. This, I'm gonna bring it back a little bit. We're going way back here. I know it's been a while. Remember this. Remember if you have a beam. Whoop, pen got caught. Remember if you have a beam that's you know bh uh, bh in cross section is l long. That if you want to determine the unit weight, you just take the air uh, the unit weight times the area because the unit weight times the volume will give you the whole weight. But I want the weight per foot. Y'all remember that? Okay, all right. So I propose then that, therefore, the self-weight of the beam, and I call that W sub naught, W sub, sub, sub O, because I, I think that's the, the original weight. And I, I like to differentiate that from W sub D because that's the superimposed dead load. I think it's easy to confuse the two. So W sub naught, that's the beam self-weight. It's gamma sub C, B, H. Now remember, this is all assumed. So this is a guess. We're going to have to check this later. So I have 0 0.15 kip. Oh, come on. My pen's getting away from me. Kip per cubic feet times 16.5 inches, 8.25 inches. Well, I got that backwards, but it doesn't really matter because 2 times 3 equals 3 times 2. Um, what's the problem with that? Now, you said multiply by 144. Do you multiply by 144? You divide because these are inches, all right? I need feet. See, this is why we do this stuff. We walk it through. So, now tell me what the beam self-weight is. Zero point one four two. Do I have a second on that? What are the units? Tips per foot. All right. 
excuse me. Now, I've got this. I got dead load and live load. What do I take with dead loads and live loads? Like, what do I do with them? Factor them, exactly, safety factors. So LRFD load factors. So how would I determine the ultimate load, the factored load? If I got dead loads and live loads, y'all did this on homework one. There you go. 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Y'all remember that? Now is this self-beam weight, is that a dead load or a live load? Dead load. So I propose 1.2 times W sub naught plus W sub D plus 1.6 W sub L. So 1.2, um, 0.142 kip per foot plus 1 kip per foot plus 1.6, 2 kips per foot equals. What does that come out to be? 4.57 kips per foot. Do I have a second on that? All right. One thing to point out, your beam weight assumption, you, you can tell how much it's going to affect your design by looking at this. If I double this number, I mean, how much is that really going to affect this? It's going to affect it, but it's not going to turn this into 8. You know, it might turn it into like 4.8 or something like that. So it's going to matter, but it's not going to matter super, super, super much. U, sub U, ultimate factored moment. Or factored load, factored load. I don't want to call it factored moment. How do I get factored moment? How do I get that? WL squared over 8. And that works only because this is a simply supported beam. If this was a cantilevered beam or something like that, that would not be the right formula. If you did not want to use a formula, break out your structural analysis and, and that, I, that I know you all know how to do. So 4.57 kip per foot times 22 feet squared over 8. And MU is what? Sound good? Okay. That's step one. Don't worry. Don't worry. This one is one of the longer steps. And here's what I mean. Watch this. And we'll end with step two. You'll see what I mean. So what is step two? You tell me. So what, what we're doing in step two is we're computing required MN, okay? So in order to do that, we're going to assume phi is 0 0.9. Again, something we're going to have to check. MN required is just mu over phi. So 276.5 divided by 0 0.9. And that comes out to be what? Say it again. So, okay, all right. So 307.2 what? No, no, units. All right. One thing I'm going to have you uh, hold on. Everybody, pay attention. Everything. One thing I'm going to have you all do right now is I'm going to say we need to convert that into inch kips. What is that? How do you convert that into inch kips? 
So what is that times 12? Point 0.4. Do I have a second on that? All right, hold, hold on, hold on, watch. That's step two. So some of the steps are longer than the others. The reason, hold on, everybody pay attention. The reason why step one is so long is because step one is essentially do the structural analysis. So there's a lot to do there, and, and that's reasonable. Some of the other steps you're going to see are going to fly by real quick. Okay, we're going to continue this example next time, and when we get here, we're just going to hit the ground running. So sort of be ready for that. Don't, don't forget, you have a homework due Wednesday. Uh, have that turned in. When class starts, that's all I got. I'll see you all on Wednesday.